Hi, this is a very quick status update on Pega. Pega is like NetVibes or iGoogle, well, with the main difference that widgets in Pega can not only access and process rather simply structured feeds, but basically any kind of rich information from the growing web of machine readable data. Uh, with the, the long-term goal of seamless data integration, smart filtering, and eventually much more efficient information management. And in order to make that simplified data integration possible, Pega introduced the so-called sparklets. These sparklets are widgets that use the W3C recommended Sparkle language to fetch, query, and mesh web data. With a nice side effect that each widget item is not just a piece of text, but is formally described in the system. So it makes it possible to use these items as filters for other widgets and other sorts of quite uh, fancy things. But well, that will be part of another screencast. So this screencast is just a quick demo of the development side of these data widgets. Each Pega system consists of two main components. One is the actual front-end server where dashboards or portals can be created and filled with widgets. And the other one is the backend systems where those widgets can be defined. These two components don't necessarily have to be on the same server. So you can have a domain-specific widget server, let's say for a conference, which is what we're currently doing here. This is a widget server for the upcoming European Semantic Web Conference. And you can have dashboards on other servers, which makes it possible to reuse widget definitions from some server and combine them with completely different widgets, but have them run in the same dashboard. And also it makes it possible to have a widget server maybe with a, on a stronger machine and the dashboard is just a very lightweight system on, on your 10 euro shared host. So this is the widget builder. There are two types of scripts, sparklets or widgets, which generate some sort of output and then functions or agents where not necessarily any output is generated. They are more running in the background. So in these two types of scripts can be combined. So you can have a sparkler which calls functions and these functions again can call sub functions or other functions. And you can have multiple data sources and multiple scripts from different locations on the web combined into a service. So it's some sort of distributed web scripting and distributed script execution then, which is kind of interesting. So let's have a look at one of those core functions. For example, load graph. Each script is running like a routine. So it's just from, from top to bottom. And at each point in the flow, you can add blocks. So if you can, for example, declare a Sparkle endpoint, assign a variable, run a query, call some function, you have some control structures, and you can generate HTML or JSON, or just return a structured value, which can then be post-processed by some other function. And here's how it looks. For each function or Sparkle, you can get some input parameters. In that case, the load graph function needs that graph parameter. So if, if there is a graph parameter, an endpoint will be specified, the load query will be run, and then some other function is called where the current timestamp of the graph is locked, which makes it possible for some other functions, for example, the refresh graph function, that can check, okay, when was that graph last fetched? And if that was fetched and within a certain time frame, an expiration, which can be specified, then it will not be reloaded that makes it possible to implement caching and stuff. So because we don't want to call remote Sparkle endpoints each time some widget instance is refreshed. So we need some local caching. So these are the core functions. And here's an example for, for Sparklet, which is then a real HTML widget. So the input parameter in that case is a tag. And if no tag is specified, the tag will be set to ESWC in the current year. This makes it possible for debugging, so we can, can test the widget with the 2008 data because there is no 2009 data yet. Again, some endpoint will be specified while where the data is cached. And yeah, that's basically it. So the graph that will be fetched is just, just a Twitter search. But this is a placeholder for the tag. So that's basically it. So we can see how that works. So this is the title and the title will then be available in the front end because all these, these spark definitions are machine readable, which makes it possible to combine them from different locations on the web. So here's how we can 
at these widget from from that widget server to a dashboard. So here's obviously a status update. The widgets can be resized and stuff. So these are just Twitter results matching the ESWC 2009 tag. You could have just changed. So the tag is an input parameter, so it's available on the settings form. Could have just said, okay, give me the tweets from South by Southwest instead. Here they are. And as you notice, the first time it takes some time to fetch the data, but then when you refresh, it's coming from the cache. Okay, for another example, querying a remote endpoint, that's the ESWC event types. So we're checking for sub-events of the main conference, like workshops, stuff like that. In that case, we're not fetching an RSS feed, but we're directly querying a remote Sparkle endpoint. In that case, the data.semanticweb.org Sparkle endpoint, which is the dog food server, part of the linked open data cloud. Let me see if I can find that. Yeah, yeah, here it is. There's the conference call with link to semanticweb.org and review. So and that's the essential the query that you're running against that endpoint. We're looking for sub-events and then for types of that sub-events and their label. And that data is then passed to a function which generates HTML from that and then again this is brought back to the dashboard server. So here are the event types. So in that case, there are no events because the default is set to 2009. But there is a year input parameter which should then be made available in the settings. So here it is. So we can say, okay, let's see if we found any sub-events in the 2008 data instead. And here we go. So this data is now coming live from the data.semanticweb.org Sparkle endpoint. So when the next thing we're going to implement is a widget, let's say with papers or people, and then you can drag a track event on the people widget and you get only those people which attended or which were part of the track event or which took part in a workshop or which had a paper in a workshop, you can filter the paper. That's, that's the thing that become possible once you have semantics in the individual widget items. But that's going to be part of another screencast. Thank you.